Um, before I hand it over to our guest speakers, I wanted to go through a really brief overview, um, just like baseline stuff about fire science, history, and ecology. Um, I'm going to go through these slides pretty quickly, just so we can have plenty of time for our speakers. Um, but we should have some time for, uh, for questions at the end, and this whole webinar will be posted on YouTube at the end as well. Um, so yeah, in my experience in this field so far, uh, the model I found most useful for thinking about fire is this series of three triangles. Um, so yeah, moving from left to right, we have three triangles here, and both the, the scale and length of time that these triangles operate on get larger moving from left to right. So I won't go into too much detail here, but I think this is just like a cool framework to have in place moving forward as we talk about fire history and ecology. Um, a lot of what we're going to be talking about today, I think, is determined in particular by this uh, fire regime triangle, which is, you know, the long term way that fire is a part of the landscape and is kind of, you know, in conversation with the landscape as well. Um, and then I also wanted to do a really brief history, some historical context for what we're going to be talking about today um, for, you know, in particular for the relationship that people in California have with fire. Um, so yeah, really quick overview, you know, this is by no means exhaustive, but, you know, for thousands of years prior to European colonization, um, natural fires ignited by lightning were relatively frequent, um, and ind indigenous groups also used purposeful fire to achieve, you know, a huge variety of goals and objectives. Um, you know, over thousands of years, our native flora and fauna adapted to this regime. Um, they developed, you know, physical traits, mechanisms of regeneration, uh, et cetera, to kind of, you know, live with the fire. Um, after colonization, um, strict fire suppression became, you know, the norm. Um, and this kind of led to the overall state we have today, where we have, you know, more often than not, we have these, these forests that are overstocked with smaller trees that are less resilient. Um, these forests are mo more vulnerable to really catastrophic wildfire um, and, you know, kind of destructive feedback loops involving things like, you know, drought, disease, pests, climate change. Um, there's a whole long list of things that are interacting with each other um, in these, you know, less resilient forests. Um, the image to the right here, I think, is a really nice kind of simplification from the Nature Conservancy of, you know, a uh, fire suppressed forest, so a forest where fires have not been allowed to come through as they kind of historically have over the last thousands of years, versus what they call here an ecologically managed forest or one, you know, where there's more larger, healthier trees and it's more resilient. So, you know, this is kind of, and the left is the, you know, oversimplified situation that, you know, through a lot of our practices, we're hoping to avoid where all the trees kind of burn down um, and they can't come back. And to the right is, you know, kind of a little nicer outcome where a fire can roll through and you can still have some trees left over. Um, so in our field day next Saturday, we're going to visit Linda Falls, which is a Napa a land trust of Napa County property. Um, and they, they've been doing some really great restoration work. Um, so I wanted to show some before and after photos of the treatments that they've been doing just to kind of get more at this idea of healthy forests. Um, so these are some before treatment photos. So you can see kind of what I was talking about before, you have, you know, it's like really dense, really overgrown, you know, a lot of what they call ladder fuel where this, if a fire were to come through, would just climb to the top of the trees and, you know, kind of burn everything down. This is after treatment. So you can kind of see what they did here. Um, they took out a lot of those small trees and piled it up. And a lot of these piles will be burned to get rid of the material. And a lot are going to be left, you know, there's some percentage that will be left as habitat piles for for wildlife um and then as a last thing um, i wanted to go through a few examples of some fire adapted species that we see here in napa um again i'm going to go through these really quickly because there's a lot of them um, but just a few examples just kind of for fun um so i want to start with some trees so here's some trees that you will commonly see in napa county and you know kind of around this region in general so we have manzanita um, which can only reproduce by seed, but they mature really quickly and their seeds are actually protected um, from fire so that they can persist in the soil. And they actually require fire to, you know, adequately germinate. Um, California bay laurel, which you see popping up a lot after fires. So they recover very quickly. They can sprout back from the root crown or the bowl and fire will, will often cause their seed to 
uh, germinate and come back really quickly. And then one of our native oaks, um, California black oak, which is just super fire resilient. Um, it has this thick insulating bark. It can sprout back from its, its roots, its root crowns, and it has this really extensive root system. Um, and its seedbed preferences match those that are you know, produced by like a low intensity fire coming through. Um, some shrubs that I'm, for the sake of time, I'm not gonna go through, but these are some, some shrubs that have some similar fire adaptations. And then one thing that people really like um, that are fun are these fire follower flowers, um, which I believe Devin's gonna show some examples of as well. Um, but you know, in a lot of cases, after a fire comes through, you'll get like a huge bloom of, of flowers just because the fire, in a lot of cases, the smoke from the fire will activate those dormant seeds to sprout. So these are some examples of some ones that you are, you know, Napa checker bloom, fire poppies that you'll see in Napa and the surrounding areas. And then just kind of a fun thing I wanted to include here um, is fungi. So there's um, some ongoing research, kind of new research going on about how fungi have adapted to fire. Um, and what's really interesting is the research about how fungi might actually, you know, modify fire regimes um, through their interactions with the plants on the surface. Um, and these are some photos I found of um, fungi popping up after fires. Um, so yeah, that's it for me. So I'm going to pass it over to Abe. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll have our speakers talk. Um, so yeah, I'm going to ask you to unmute Abe. And just, yeah, let me know when you want me to move on to the next slide. All right. Well, my name is Abram Lopez. Um, most of my work has been as a land steward um, and fire practitioner, but also a wildland firefighter. I got into it uh, because of this work. Uh, a big part of it was initially when we uh, did this this work in my uh, tribe's homeland, I'm uh, Mutsin and, and Tamian. Uh, our tribes are from the around the central coast, uh, part of the part of California. A lot of our work went along with uh, mimicking the effects of fire on the land. And along that path, I started asking a lot of times, like, why aren't we burning? You know, we keep saying how we're doing this work because it would be burned traditionally. Like, why aren't we burning? So that's kind of what started me on my path going on. Uh, being a fire practitioner. And um, so just, you know, an acknowledgement and, uh, you know, of the, the peoples from the, the territory around Napa and, and, you know, sending out my respect, you know, to the, you know, all four directions, uh, the Pomo people, the Miwok people, the Mishwo, uh, Wapo people or Onasates, uh, also the uh, Ohlone's. A lot of us were very fluid uh, in these areas, but, um, I know primarily is uh, the Onasates, uh, the Wapos in Napa, um, but I just wanted to make sure that I, I acknowledge that. Um, so, yeah, like uh, the, the title says, relationship with land, and that's basically what I was learning this whole time. Uh, everything I did fell into that because it's a different concept to get used to. Uh, we look at these things outside of ourselves. But um, the water, the fire, all these things are, are part of our relationship with that. So uh, excluding that and looking at, at it uh, outside of that makes it diff difficult to understand how these systems coincide with each other. And the beautiful thing is that I, I feel like we're all kind of getting that no matter which way uh, direction we go. But uh, so that's basically what I'm going with, uh, with here with at least my aspect of what I'm sharing. And so, yeah, uh, uh, land fire, you know, food, learning traditional, uh, you know, fire and culture. My uh, stewardship as, you know, starting in, in 2014 is when we really got into it. And as you can see, there's there's photos of uh, me removing pampas grass um, and also doing some uh, uh archaeological uh, and ethnobotanical, actually that's an ethnobotanical survey, but we were stopping to look at some grindstone. Next. So uh, this all led to uh, me becoming a, a cultural fire practitioner, uh, getting my, my basic uh, firefighter type two training, 
you know, we, uh, me and my brother actually were uh, given the opportunity to go out and train in Tassajara with the fire monks out there. Uh, we did a week long training with uh, the people from Central Coast Prescribed Fire Council. They have been our fire mentors ever since. Uh, out there, we learned about a lot of the things that the gentleman had talked about before about uh, fuels, ladder fuels, uh, how that affects fire. Uh, basically, the, the idea wraps up around how, how to safely be able to engage in cultural burning and fire in modern day era. You know, um, a lot of people are fortunate enough to, to have the space to be able to uh, do prescribed burning the old way, but um, where our tribe is at and where the majority of the work needs to be done, it's in WUI or uh, Wildland Urban Interface. So, you know, we had to go and, and get an extensive amount of training just to even start down this path. And so, uh, yeah, we, we learned about the safety and fire protocol, the fire suppression, um, and understanding, um, you know, prescribed burning, just the basics of it, uh, and how to conduct ourselves while we're out there. Cause we were planning on, um, eventually burning and, and traditional, our traditional territory, but also training with other tribes. Uh, we learned, uh, a little bit about fire ecology, uh, the importance of low intensity burning, you know, especially because traditionally that's what we wanted. Uh, you, you really didn't want, and this is a generalization, but you really didn't want it to be much, you know, above, you know, knee height as, as a generalization. You know, of course there was other situations that if the prescription called for it, you know, we, um, you know, of course the, the role that fire plays, I try not to get too much in the weeds on this because a lot of it was explained already, but, um, you know, the ecological benefits, which, which we all kind of know, and, um, you know, the negative effects of uh, fire suppression, which was, you know, it took me a little while to kind of grasp some of these things. And that kind of goes back to what I was talking about with the relationship on the land. And um, not saying that as a, um, you know, a poo poo on, on suppression, they do a good job, too good of a job, you know, and, and it kind of lends to some of the problems we have nowadays and um, why there's a big push to have uh, more prescribed burning. We see the uh, ecological effects and, and how it's, it's caused problems. And so, you know, luckily everybody's kind of on the same page on that now, but like for us, you know, for me earlier on day one, um, it was easy for me to become an uh, advocate for it, especially knowing the cultural aspect and, and what I knew from my, uh, the cultural elders and the people I work with next. And so, yeah, this is um, this is me doing uh, a couple of different things, but uh, this kind of falls into the the, the eco management and how a lot of this kind of a lot of the work and the research that we did uh, lent towards not just um, you know painting a picture uh, scientifically, you know it, it makes it a little bit more receptive to the larger community um, instead of. Uh, I don't mean to sound weird, but I'm gonna be straight up, you know, instead of a bunch of natives trying to tell everybody how to do things, you know, we, we want to, uh, you know, have a sound argument. Um, but, you know, it started out with, uh, you know, weed management and invasive removal, you know, just if we're working on a garden that we have or a certain uh, gathering area and uh or just generally in, a, in an area where where there's uh, some exotic plants that are are uh, how would you say they're just crowding everything out? They're aggressive. Um, they really don't have any ecological um, benefits to them. You know, that's where we started. Like I was talking about with the pampas grass. Um, you know, we did plant surveys. Um, you know, basically monitoring and and coming up with the numbers on. You know, are these these plants improving where we're working, or you know, monitoring areas where we haven't worked, like what resources do they have there? You know, if we do work there in the future, what are we looking at? And, and this usually had to do with, um, with the native plants and ethnobotanically um, relevant plants that we'd be working with. Um, uh, vegetation removal. And, and I, I guess you would say that's kind of along the lines of like a, a native invasive, you know, um, which is kind of a, a weird thing, but, you know, basically a native plant that wouldn't have grown there normally if a regular fire regime would have came through. So it's uh, things like opening up uh, native grassland prairies. 
uh, and and also planting native gardens. Uh, so a lot of these things were some of the first, you know, real jobs I got to before before I really got to put some fire down. Uh, and also, like I mentioned before, you know, um, doing the research that, that to back this up, you know, looking into the, the, the prehistoric and historic uh, knowledge that we had there, um, doing the, the archaeological field schools with Berkeley and, you know, the, the ethnobotanical um, education that we would have, learning the different plants, learning how they interacted with each other. You know, it was all it was all relevant, especially when you applied it to how the culture looked at a lot of these things. And you kind of have an aha moment where it's like, OK, you know, you see the kind of the puzzle, you see everything kind of coming together. And, um, you know, when it comes to like just what we've learned as far as, you know, fire ecology, then, you know, we also learn, well, what is the samples from uh, the soil samples of flotation that we took? What is that saying when they quantify uh, the light fraction and they're looking at the uh, the charred botanicals and, and actually saying, oh no, these were the plants and the the um, the resources that were being uh, utilized. And you know, back when we started, there was still a lot of people arguing, oh well, were these native people really burning? You know, were we really burning? Did our ancestors really burn? It's like, dude, we got the proof. You know, um, and so I, I was fortunate enough to be along with those field schools to be uh, part of the uh, flotation and get to do some sorting out in the, the California Archaeology Lab out in Berkeley. Next. And so, yeah, this is, uh, I put this out, the desired effect is kind of uh, touching on some things they talked about earlier. Um, you can see the differences between uh, thin and prescribed managed, uh, just thinned and untouched and, and how it affected it. I also have this nice picture of a, a, a nice creeping backing fire that's, you know, low intensity, you know, that's what you really want to see. It's a generalization. So, I mean, I don't mean that that applies to everything when it comes to burning, but, you know, generally it's, it's kind of nice to see those, especially when it comes to, uh, you know, cultural burning when you're uh, burning for uh, uh, traditional resources. Um, and there's a picture of me and my, my brother after a burn, after we you know, got a mop up done. So I, I, I added that one in, you know, just kind of showing that, you know, uh, us getting our training, getting, getting some stuff done, getting some real dirt under our fingernails. Next. And so, yeah, this all, this all comes down to, um, or at least our, our also desired effect is, you know, the re the post fire rejuvenization and, um, you know, the, the reduction of, of, different pests that might affect your uh, your natural resources that you're going after, maybe be uh, medicine plants, um, you know, crafting plants. There's, there's a lot of different uh, pests that, that are, are invading a lot of these, these, uh, these resources that are out of whack because, you know, maybe fire would have helped clear out some of these pests. Uh, I, I I could kind of go on that subject for a while. So I'm, excuse me if I'm kind of uh, breezing through, I don't want to take too much longer, but, um, but yeah, it also produces good basketry material. Uh, you get that burn, burn off, you know, uh, kind of coppicing the, the plant where it, you get the, the desired growth out of it. You, you do it at the right time of year, the right intensity without, you know, burning the, the roots to where it doesn't kill it off. Uh, it'll sprout back uh, uh, better material. Uh, with, cert with certain ones, uh, like I said, I'm kind of generalizing at the moment um, for sake of time and everything, but um, and uh, opens opens the land for uh, grasses and wildflowers. And, um, you know, for a lot of people, they love it just because they're beautiful. But for us, for me, when I see those those hillsides, that's a productive piece of land right there. Um, if I had that, that meant, I, you know, that me and my tribe were successful at tending our land and producing. We would have more game there because um, from a, a generalization for the most part, those open grassland prairies are, are higher producing when it comes to cra crafting uh, materials, but also majorly with food. Uh, we ate a lot of uh, grass seed, which, uh, you know, you hear about the acorn a lot, which was a big staple for us as well. 
but grass seed was a huge one for us. And, you know, burning really makes it different with that, you know, to keep it open and, and keep that coyote brush out that really loves to move in there if you don't burn regularly. Um, but uh, the, the wildflowers, there's a lot of uh, edible resources within those uh, and crafting as well. So, uh, you know, just the, uh, the production goes way up and you have, you have higher production for humans. You have higher production for your game. You're going to be eating a more diverse um, uh, diet. So uh, then we move on to uh, reintroduction of native plants and traditional uh, propagation. So trying to kind of going on on that, uh, you see it a lot nowadays uh, where they're trying to repopulate uh, certain plants that were there before, you know, help. It, it depends when it's when it's properly planned. It can be an ecological benefit. Um, but, you know, it, it does have to be something that was that's looked into. And more generally, if it can be, I, I would like to just see the natural ones kind of recover where they where they already do well. But sometimes, you know, it, it's OK to I think to, to reintroduce stuff if it's uh, beneficial. Next. And yeah, so this is um, this is just some uh, photos of me and my brother uh, first getting our our uh, wildland firefighter type two uh, certs. This is out at Tassajara, and that's us taking a pack test with our, a couple of our fire mentors from Central Coast Prescribed Fire Council, and us doing our first uh, pile burnout in, in Tassajara. And um, you know, it's a it's it's been a big part of of you know, our success, but also, you know, it's, it's imperative that we do that to keep our culture and to be successful in the land tending techniques that we want to see in the future. Next. And so, yeah, these are just also some pictures of uh, tracks and uh, talking a little bit about good fire. You know, we all kind of are on the same page, I, I think on that as well, you know, live fire operations, got cultural burn education from great people like Frank Lake and, and Bill Tripp and, and Margo Robbins. And there's a lot of good people up there with a lot of knowledge that, that shared that with me and my, my brother and, and a lot of the other people that engage in the trexes that they have out there. Um, you know, sexual, uh, successful, um, local community collaboration, got to see that up there, which was awesome. You know, a lot of different people coming together for these burns and from different agencies and, and uh, private uh, companies and landowners. Next. And so, yeah, uh, basically, you know, I wanted to add this. This is, uh, you know, some of the kids I got to work with and uh, family members and uh, some of my, my, uh, my Tamian family uh, gathering and doing some crafting with these. Uh, this is what it's all about. You know, at the end of the day, you know, I'm I'm, I'm biased. I, I want to see as much fire that can be done safely as possible. And, you know, because me, it's, it's part of my culture. And I do realize that there's a lot of tools in, in the shed. But for me, I think fire is one of the top ones, at least ecologically, for a lot of the, the fire adapted and culturally significant plants that we work with. And so with that, I want to say thank you and uh, give my acknowledgement to Tamiya Nation. Uh, Central Coast Prescribed Fire Council, uh, Krug Tribe, uh, CFMC, um, Mikwik, Tassajara Zen Center, uh, uh, the Nature Conservancy, Bell Forestry, San Mateo RCD, uh, AMLT, and Terra. And thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Aaron. So much information. And I wish that we had like two hours to give both you and Devin to share even more. Um, but I did want to make sure that we open it up for any questions that anyone might have at this point. I'd like to ask a question. Sure, go for it, Peter. So as discussed, uh, prescribed fire is really critical as a tool, both in terms of ecological integrity, but also as a tool for increasing fire safety of our communities. However, people understandably have a lot of fear around prescribed fire and fire in general in our modern day and age. So coming from a culture that very much welcomes prescribed fire and sees it as healthy, how can we make that shift towards that mindset here in our modern culture? I'd like to ask your take on that. 
Well, um, traditionally, I would say that there was no other way for us to, to fight fire other than fire. We didn't have big fire engines. So if you didn't burn, you might burn, um, <laughs> uh, so to speak. But, um, you know, kind of a similar idea, though. I mean, uh, modern day is, is people are seeing it now. You know, when I first started and working out in Santa Cruz, there was a lot of people that weren't really into what I was talking about, you know, and, and I'm trying my best to convince them and, and pull them over because, you know, ecologically minded people. And I told them, you know, uh, oh, well, what about this species and what about that species? And, and they're endangered. And I'm like, well, do you ever think it might be endangered because we're excluding something that's naturally supposed to be on the land? You know, and you also uh, look at it like this is, you know, from a firefighter's perspective. Do you want to do you want to wait till the bully is all prepared and comes, you know, with all his guns and is going to knock you out? Or, or do you want to pick your time to fight? I like, that. you know, you, you know, people people worry about uh, an es escaped prescribed burn. You got resources already there and you got people prepared, you know, so be honest with you. I mean, even in the worst case scenario, it's still less of an issue than, you know, wildfire. And I think anybody can by now, especially anywhere in California, they've all seen what happens. We don't take care of these fuel loads. I mean, do we, do we want to see another, you know, I, I won't even mention the towns cause I don't want to bring out, you know, bad stuff or whatever, but we, we can't get through this by just ignoring the problem and waiting for it to come to us. You know, especially people, uh, the people that live in the wooey, they're the ones that, that are, you know, most like, oh, oh, it's like, hey, man, you should be the one most worried. You know, you got to take care of your ladder fuels. You got to break up that continuity of fuel. You know, like the, they were saying earlier, you can't have all the trees the same size, especially smaller trees that are susceptible to burning. You know, you got that continuity of fuel. Fire's just going to rip right through there. You ain't, you ain't doing fuel reduction. And, and don't get me wrong. You know, mixing it with other tools, like like with using livestock and and prescribed burning, chipping. Uh, I love to run a saw. I know it's not the most traditional thing to say, but you know, I love to run a chainsaw, um, and you know, get that prep work done. You know, if you could do some pile burns, get the low hanging fruit. You know, uh, pick your battles when you can, and and you know, you don't got to run through and just do a crazy, you know, cowboy. Uh, fire, you know, clearing thing, you know, there's, uh, there's, there's ways to go about it. I feel like, you know, we have the experience, we have, we have the tools. I, I think it could be done safely just about anywhere as long as it's planned out. Right. And, but yeah, sorry, I'm all, I don't want to go on a tangent. <laughs> and I think the key is to get the low hanging fruit and get some small, safer burns done first that will pave the way for larger projects in the future. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. I think for sake of time, we will move on to our next speaker, Devin. Uh, so thanks, Avrin. Thanks for your question, Peter. Um, and then just a reminder too, if you have any questions that pop up at any time, chat box is there. Um, but Devin, we'll pass it over to you. And then are you going to share your screen or should we flip through your slides? I can't quite remember. Oh, okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me and thanks for being here. Thanks, Abram, for your wonderful talk. Um, I just want to acknowledge that Pepperwood sits within the traditional homeland of the Wapo people, um, as kind of Abram had mentioned. Um, cultural um, burning and burning practices um, started by humans for um, countless reasons um, has been happening in California for uh, as far as matters. Um, <clears throat> In recent years, um, I'm, I'm probably going to say a number of things that people have said um, already, but uh, we were really, we got really good at fire suppression. Um, but currently, just kind of this is a map of um, fires in Sonoma and Napa County within uh, basically since 2010, I want to say. Um, and you can see it's, it's covering a large portion of our area. And these are wildfires. Um, and so Suppression has gotten to the point um, where we were too good at it, um, and the fuels have built up too much, and now um, they're getting beyond our control. The, our traditional suppression methods are no longer working because of fuel loading, um, and then you also put climate change on top of that. The Tubbs fire, for example, in 2017 um, had 70 mile an hour winds. 
that 70 mile an hour winds is not necessarily something that had traditionally happened um, during those fire season types of years. So um, Embercast was shooting two miles ahead, um, making any suppression efforts nearly in impossible. Um, so evacuations is basically um, all our emergency services folks have been able to do during these um, extreme wind driven um, events. And then on top of that, you have these heavy fuel loads. Um, so just kind of want to give that into, into context of how much wildfire we're seeing in this area. And I think this is why these conversations are coming up. Um, and as Abram had said, this is this is getting people to kind of like turn their their head and go, what methods can we be implementing? Um, and why are these wildfires getting so ex extreme in our areas? Um, uh, am I in presentation mode? Um, this is just an example. Um, Pepperwood kind of sits in the middle there. Um, we burnt in 2017 in the Tubbs fire, um, and then again um, in 2019 in the Kincaid fire. Um, and you can see the yellow is the Tubbs fire, um, the Kincaid's the red fire, and then that orange area kind of in the middle um, is the area that those fires overlapped. Uh, Pepperwood uh, was basically, uh, it was almost entirely on our property. Um, so we got to kind of um, experience both of those uh, fires. Um, the fire effects on, from both of them were, were, were different, and I'll, I'll kind of go into that a little bit more. Uh, so this is uh, an aerial photo of Pepperwood um, after the Tubbs fire. Um, the big building you kind of see in there is um, a concrete structure, um, and I think it really just goes to show that um, home hardening, um, building-wise, um, especially for people in the WUI, um, is really, really important. Um, I tell people some of the most environmentally friendly things you can do is not let your house burn down because the toxic chemicals coming from burning homes um, is so much more pollutant than vegetation burning. Um, so we had built this concrete structure, um, I think in 2010, with the idea that it'll be fire resistant. Um, and sure enough, it ended up being. Concrete is expensive in a lot of places. So there's a number of ways, but I just kind of wanted to show that even living in these areas, you know, protecting our homes um, is critical, um, you know, for our own well beings, but um, it's also a very um, environmentally conscious thing. So I think working from the home out is, is, is a really good practice, um, especially for folks that necessarily don't have a lot of land to tend to. Um, this was our barn. Um, unfortunately, uh, it did not survive the Tubbs fire um, and just kind of some of the drastic uh, differences that. Um, some of those defensible spaces um, and the way structures are built can really make a difference. These structures are um, maybe 100 yards from each other. Um, so they were dealing with the same the same fire um, at the same time. And then, Devin, I'm going to pause you real fast. I don't believe you're in presentation mode, so we haven't seen um, like oh. your most recent slides of the burnt structure. There we go. Okay, now you can see it. Okay. Yeah, but you're. Did you see that the uh, the this one? We see it now, and then oh. if, but you're still not in presentation mode. Yeah, I, I went into presentation mode. Oh gosh. <laughs> There's some weird thing with the sharing the screen, but I can just let you know if the slides. Okay, I'll click through it this way. Uh, apologies okay. for. That sounds good. Thanks, Evan. Uh, yeah, so building in the middle there is the the what we call our, our the Dwight Center. Um, and then this was our, our, our burden workshop. Um, so I, I just kind of want to start off because, you know, Peter brought up like, this is scary. Like our, our communities have experienced wildfires um, that have been extreme, destructive, have taken lives, have taken tons of structures. Um, and it, it is it is scary. Um, I was in a super fortunate position to experience the wildfire the nature's recovery of wildfire. And that's really what I'm going you know, to hopefully focus on um, here. And um, I just want to, you know, hold the space for understanding that this is scary and it is devastating. Um, my father lost his home in the Tubbs fire. Um, my boss lost his home. I had a bunch of stuff in this barn that got burnt. So it, it was very personally traumatic on, on that kind of 
possession human front um, way, but uh, to watch nature recover from this and how adapted it is uh, was uh, inspiring. Um, this is our California state grass, purple needle grass. Um, it is a wonderful grass. It has like a root system of like 22 feet. Um, it stores a ton of carbon in our atmosphere and it burnt in, this is within a week after the Tubbs fire um, and it already was breeding up. Um, this is in October, no rain, and it's sending out green shoots. Its deep root system is tied into a water source way below ground. Um, it is immediately happy um, after the fire, um, even in the middle of um, summer. And um, it stabilizes the soil. So when, uh, you know, potential erosion of like, oh, no, we don't have any vegetative cover with these native perennial grasses, it's going to hold on to soil. Um, that green grass is vegetation for wildlife to eat immediately after the fire. So the combination of the relationships between the vegetation and the animals being fire adapted um, is, is really cool to see. Uh, the wildflower blooms, um, Gabe had mentioned fire follower species, uh, but even the non-fire follower species. We have lupin blooms every year. Um, but the lupin blooms post fire were incredible. Um, things like I'd never seen before. Um, we've had some people reach out to us. There's, a, there's been a lot of talk about super blooms this year. Um, at Pepperwood, I feel like our blooms are not that exciting this year because we haven't had the fires um, in recent years. So the years following fires, the, that's when we've had our extreme wildflower blooms. Um, and I think they get those what they call the super blooms in um, environments that lack water, and they get them on high water years. I see our quote unquote super blooms in areas that uh, we lack fire and you reintroduce fire into those areas because it seems like our system isn't necessarily walk, missing water, but it, it's missing fire. Um, so just another great example of a post um, spring wildfire. You can see in the background um, the Douglas fir trees um, that had probably encroached over time um, got pretty wiped out, but the open meadow um, was happier than I've ever seen it. Um, a little bit out of order here. Uh, acorns immediately starting to, to germinate into those ash pits. Those ash pits are nutrients um, and uh, provide a lot of open space for these acorns to finally reach the ground and have more germination. Um, a number of species re-sprout really well um, from the base. So even though they look top killed, you'll immediately start seeing this kind of vegetation response from them. Um, and, and this is within weeks of the wildfire with no precipitation. Um, I think an important thing to think about is wildlife. Again, the newts, the critters that are underground um, are our herps, um, our insects, um, kind of the smaller critters that you think are just going to get totally wiped out by these wildfires. They have an adaptive response to this as well. Newts at this time are, are usually burying themselves underground. Um, insects have laid their eggs in areas that are either in the ground or inside um, protective vegetation. Um, and then we have our... Uh, our deer. This is within, you know, a couple weeks of the wildfire. I think we have this like, concept in, in Western culture of Bambi. Um, you, wildfire comes, all the wildlife go, oh no, and sprint out of the forest. That is not the case. They may remain in the forest the whole, the whole time. They might dance around the fire, um, but they know how to move around the fire, um, and they know when that vegetation is going to come back. Um, and this is a really important aspect of having native species um, in our fire in our fire um, area because those species will then uh, uh, they will react to the fire in a way that then can create food forage for um, the wildlife. Um, I have a little photo series. We have a number of wildlife cameras um, that were up um, during the wildfire. Um, so this photo series starting in the top uh, left of the, the buck um, kind of moving through, this is a photo series within 24 hours of each other. So the buck moved through, the fire comes through um, later that evening, they have timestamps on them. Um, so uh, that is like 2 a.m. Um, 
the next day, oh, that this first photo is not um, the same day, but it's the same camera. So just to give me give you an idea, the wildlife is there. Um, you can see ember still on the ground um, at two thirty, um, and then moving into three fourteen, a coyote's moving right back through that area. Um, and then at uh, later that evening, around eleven forty at night, um, a jackrabbit's moving through the area. Later in that morning, around nine a.m., nine thirty. Uh, you have your your deer moving back through. So with this 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 fire kind of um, the wildlife know how to respond to um, not just our vegetation, um, and they know where the vegetation is going to to respond quickly. So all of our our native species are very very well adapted to to fire. So we think of of fire um, being a really good thing. Um, or at least, you know, in an ecological mind, and that's kind of what we've been saying, um, uh, saying through throughout this presentation. Um, that being said, is our fuels are really heavy, overloaded, um, and uh, this is a good example of an area that we did treatment on the left-hand side of the road, um, and you can see there's not any of the uh, Douglas fir encroachment into our oak woodlands, um, and then on the right, that's an area that we did not do any treatment in, so we did not bring um, chainsaws um, to cut and, and pile um, and burn, and I think that was the treatment on the left-hand side. Um, so thinking back to those kind of uh, uh, fire triangles and ladder fuel, um, if a wildfire comes through here, um, the area on the right, we're probably going to see higher tree mortality than the area on the left. Um, this is another example of a very Douglas fir encroached area. And the reason this happens um, is because we don't have low intensity fires to kind of keep these Douglas fir trees in, in a balance. Um, they're a native tree, but when you take away that disturbance regime, um, they get out of whack um, and kind of start to put pressure on your oak trees and you get oak tree mortality, um, the trees get stressed. Um, and you can imagine the wildlife don't wanna move through that area. Imagine being a big buck with a big rack um, during rutting season and you have to get it through that forest. You're probably less likely to find a, a mate if that's the forest you have to deal with than um, a potentially um, more open forest. Like so. So this is some of the treatments that we've done um, in preparation for bringing back prescribed fire and in pre preparation for, for the next wildfire because um, we've removed ladder fuel. Um, so this is the treatment we did pile building. So we kind of came through here and cut all the Douglas firs out and put them in piles um, and then we'll burn them the next following winter. Um, example of, of kind of piles burning. Um, and once we kind of have our forests to a point that um, there are these fuels reductions have happened, we can kind of be less um, fearful of wildfires, especially with our home hardenings protected, uh, knowing our plants and animals will respond positively to this and they know how to react to it. Um, and then we can also bring in, um, like I said, prescribed prescribed fire, cultural fire, um, ecological fire, good fire. I think there's a, a, a lot of names and they all have kind of nuances to them. Um, but the point is that we're bringing back fire for both protecting our communities, um, promoting uh, natural resources um, and, and starting to reintroduce a culture of fire. Um, I think there is something inherent about fire in humans that um, we use it for cooking our food. Um, humans would not be where we are today without using fire. Um, and I don't think anybody can deny that. And um, last year at Pepperwood, I'm really proud to say we burnt 196 acres um, of, of land through prescribed fire. Um, so if you looked over our mountain and you saw a big cloud of, um, of smoke, uh, sorry, but not sorry, because it's the work that needs to be happening. Um, and kind of to, to, to Peter's point of, um, how do we get this culture back of like fire can be beneficial and not scary? And uh, I really think it's um, putting fire on the ground, getting people out there, um, starting to teach our kids about fire is not necessarily scary. Um, I think fear comes from the unknown. Um, and the more we get to know fire, um, the better we can understand it. Um, it doesn't always need to be scary, especially if we understand, hey, uh, 
fire's not going to burn right now because the fuel moisture level is so high, or um, if it's going to move through this area, well, there's not much ladder fuel, so it's just going to creep on the ground. Um, so I think really educating people around this fire knowledge um, is really important to people accepting it um, as part of our, our common culture. Um, and um, I think it's a great way to bring people together. I, there's not many things where you get government agencies, uh, local tribes, ecologists all on the same page. Um, and I think if we're all on the same page on something, we need to run with it. So that's my presentation. Thank you, everybody. Amazing. Uh, I wish, um, again, that we just had more time to talk more. Thank you both so much. Um, Want to open it up for any questions from anyone? I really just thought it was interesting. I oftentimes think about the wildlife and how long until they come back into a burned area and how affected they really are by a fire moving through their habitat. And so the seeing those time stamp stamped photos from that cam was pretty interesting for me personally, but. Yes, Erica. Hey. Yes. Hi, Danielle and Abrin and um sorry, Devin. I'm thinking Peter, but Devin, thank you so much for your presentations. I just think they were, I mean, the pictures and you all saying that is so important. And I work for the NRCS, so trying to get the word out about prescribed fire as well. So really appreciate your perspective. And I'm just wondering if you all have seen prescribed fire more commonly uh, conducted by private landowners. I know that there are a lot of barriers to get fire on the ground and for a place like Pepperwood, it's a little easier with full-time employees. So I'm just wondering on your, your, on your experience of seeing actual private landowners put fire on the ground and um, how, how that's been perceived because in Napa it has been uh, easier to talk to people about it, but actually getting it done, I think, is still a barrier here. Um, I'll just quickly jump in and let Abram maybe has something to say, too. Um, I think so. Um, I think it's a slow process. I think we're at the very beginning of a, a long, a long, you know, um, a long process to bring bring this. There's a 120 years of poor ecological management, um, and it might take 120 years to get there. Um, and I think that's a decent way to think about it. Um, in terms of private landowners, I think getting people to do pile burning at their at their home is a really kind of safe intermediate way. Get them introduced to the fire, um, do some fuels reduction, get a sea fire behavior, um, and that's. Uh, but I have seen a little bit more. But I I agree it is um, a barrier in places that do have full time employees or. Um, uh, it, it is different than a private life. Yeah, um, I totally agree with everything Devin said. Uh, I've got to got to see a little bit in some of the Trexes. Some of them are, are private landowners that engage with that. Um, I also, I think it was in 2020, worked at one of a tribe, one of our tribal members, or is uh, from my my Mootsen family. Um, but a tribal member that, that lived out in Davis and we did some piles out on his property. Um, so that, at least out there, wasn't, it wasn't too tough. You know, I mean, he basically just got the permit from the local fire department. Um, you know, we came up with a pretty good game plan, uh, this pile burns, low hanging fruit. Um, but it, it starts with that. I would say, you know, with, with, with the community, it starts with finding somebody who's willing to uh, take that first step and you try to engage everybody who's interested um, and even offer it out to the naysayers. You explain to them through the whole process, uh, educate them on why this is more important to do this and, and safer to do this as opposed to just, you know, waiting for the worst to happen because you know, it's going to be impossible for us to treat every every area every area in California that's going to um, burn. But you know, at least addressing the WUI, the the wildland urban interface, I mean, it's it's critical for us. You know, we don't want to see any other tragedies where um, life life is lost. You know, and and you know, it makes it easier if in worst case scenario the fire is going to rip through some of these people's properties, man. Like it's going to make it safer for the firefighters that have to go in and try to save these people. Um, you know, as a, as a firefighter, 
you know, I would like to see as much work done uh, during the uh, the safer times of year than having to deal with all the, you know, the craziness in, in the middle of a wildfire. You know, these are all things that could be addressed and, and just educating the, the community, you know, reaching out to people. Like I said, even if they're naysayers, well, you know, just come along and check it out and you could talk to them and they, they might still be on the fence. But uh, slowly but surely, as, as Devin said, you know, you, you see the change happen. Like when I first started doing, uh, even just talking about it in Santa Cruz, very slow moving. Then all of a sudden it just like, especially after uh, some of these fires happened and ripped through, you know, everything changed. But, um, you know, it's, it's a couple of things like that. Sorry. Great. Well, thanks for the responses. Um, and then in our last minute together, I guess, Gabe, I don't know if you want to just pull up the last slide with some upcoming events. Um, and then, as always, feel free to reach out to Gabe or I directly to, oh, the poll. Sorry. Let me pull up the poll real fast while Gabe maybe does a plug about upcoming stuff. Sorry, I couldn't find the unmute button. Yeah, so Danielle's going to do one more poll. And then I wanted to, for our workshop next week, I want to do a quick plug. Um, we're going to be talking a lot about, um, during this field trip, we're talking a lot about kind of, you know, benefits of being out in the forest. We'll, we'll talk a lot about fire depth species as well. It's going to be, you know, pretty casual. Um, but I just, I wanted to share this, this fun uh, collage of forest health benefits. There's a lot of research into this. And it's something we talk a lot about um with people kids you know when we're talking to groups just about you know the benefits of being outside there's lots of proven health benefits um so we're hoping to see some of that next weekend um that's another slide about that that i can skip um so this is a plug for a field day so yeah we're just gonna do a little hike um it'll just be a morning we're gonna talk about forest health you can see examples of the work they've done um at linda falls um and talk a little bit about some of the fire depth of species we can see over there um, this is some of our other upcoming events, so you can always find our calendar on our website. Um, there's also a link to Pepperwood's website is there uh, there as well. So this is a busy time of year for us. We we definitely have a lot of events coming up for anyone who is local to Napa. Um, there's there's plenty going on if you want to join us for any of these. Um, I've got one more slide after this. No, I don't. So yeah, I put both um, Danielle and my email addresses in here. So if you do have any questions um please feel free to email either or both of us um and we'll definitely be happy to answer those um and we will be posting the recording of this presentation on youtube within the next couple of days and we'll send out an email to anyone who registered with the link to that as well and that's that's all i have <laughs>